last year when I attended a lecture at Nalanda University, which was still posted in Delhi at that point, uh, about uh, it was a remote sensing scientist who had done an analysis of the entire region with remote uh, technology and thereby could evoke what could possibly be found underground in this region that we were starting to dig. So I thought, oh my god, what a fantastic region, I want to check it out. Um, so we made plans to come in, um, it's, it's, been, it's been really interesting, also because I think, um, I, I would definitely think of, you know, that one develop this possibly into a collaborative research project, and I was kind of asking myself yesterday whether I should have chosen my tenth lecture, um, because it is obviously the religious landscape that interests me here. Um, but in a way, I'm glad I didn't. I mean, what you're hearing today is a lecture about Delhi and about resettlement in Delhi. But it is in this context that I have developed a different way of reading landscape through the various ice and paper and the passion projects that inform these kind of ways of seeing the land. And it's from there that I think I would like to study Hinduism again. Hinduism, which uh, when I studied it last time was very much informed by places of ritual, caste, possibly urban politics, but where I felt I might have paid less attention to passion projects. And when I mean passion projects, I mean people's ability to see things in landscape we don't see, right? So in other words, what I'm assuming is that people look at the landscape and see some things that don't see others, right? I go through a landscape and I see the temples immediately. Other people will see other things. And uh, in fact, we bought two similar maps today. They were pilgrimage maps that had the same temples, but then some of them had Buddha and some had Shiva. So this was one map for Hindus and one for Buddhists. Same map, but very different iconography to read this map. So this is where, where I'm going with this. And I want to use the case study of Gibra Sanda to explain where it is. Um, in order to explain to you what I mean by reading the landscape and how this involves what I call the anthropology of the senses, which is of course an exact anthropology, which means involving people's way of smelling, hearing, uh, not just see, touching. Um, so this is what it's about. Um, this is where it starts, right? I mean, I visit this uh, resettlement colony, and I'll give you in a moment all the facts about it, so don't worry about it yet. Um, so you see this landscape, and uh, I can tell you I went for the first time with a, um, with the officer from the MCD, and then he'd say, um, oh, look at how this is so dirty, how people are kind of, you know, making a mess of this, this is supposed to be a park, does this look like a park to you? Um, so he was very angry with that. I mean, I obviously started observing, I was wondering why is this man, old man climbing a wall? Why would an old man of that age climb a wall? Why would these people put, uh, this is just kind of, you know, to make it visible for you. So why would they put ladders there? And what's happening here? So some, something is happening here, you know, they're doing this, and somebody's keeping wood there. And I can see that the officer would think this is all very unruly, and it looks not very clean. Why would they be doing this? So this is just to get you on board of where we are. We are, of course, in Delhi. And um, I started the study in Delhi because in um, uh, 2008 there was a lot of discussion around resettlement. There were close to one million people being uh, um, uh, removed from the sites that were living in the inner city. Uh, their jukis were demolished and they were sent out to resettlement colonies. Um, so if this is a very rough map of Delhi, then the people I was working with used to live there, uh, stay there, right? In the Jamna Pushka, right in the center between uh, Luchin Delhi and uh, the Old Delhi. So it's really near ITO um, and uh, in the, in the Namada Plains. Now what happened to them in the course of resettlement is this is where they went. Okay. This is very interesting. I mean, it's interesting for economic uh, students too because what happens here is you have urban Delhi and you have village Delhi. Now what they were doing is not only kind of greening and cleaning Delhi to make it presentable to the British Queen or whoever was going to be the guest of the Commonwealth game, um, but what they're also made doing were cleaning up the statistics. Now what happens is when you lift more than one million people out of inner Delhi and put them in rural Delhi, 
then suddenly your urban statistics look very different because you're the people living below the poverty line have, are no longer 40%, but they're 25% or 30%. This uh, is a different way of selling the city to international investors because you can say they're less poor people means that skills level will be higher, right? And this will attract international investment. So there was lots of things going on. Why this was done? Why it was done the way it was done? Why did these people move out so far when actually they, there was not this was lots of space from here on? This is the entire rural belt, which has lots of space. So actually, you leave the city, you drive 10 kilometers to open land, you drive through a village, and then comes the reason of the economy. So there's you know other reasons behind this. All this takes part as part of the Clean and uh, Green Daily campaign, um, and this is just one of the impressions you got at that time from the demolishing of. Um... Now here is one of the colleagues, uh, uh, Dupont. She is a uh, Dupont from France. She's done a bit of statistics. She has, of course, not. I mean, we are we, not really seeing the peak here yet, but you see how this is peaking at the time when the uh, Commonwealth Games were um, uh, decided to be held in Delhi. This is when they started, then there was kind of a slump, and then you know, it comes to a total peak. Uh, and then after 2010, there were hardly any demolishing at all. Nowadays, there are not too many. It's, it's beautifully no longer feasible. So here you get, uh, you get an impression of what I said. You go out the village, you uh, drive through fields, and then you see in the background, you see this uh, um, thing happening. This is what it looks like now. It's quite urban. And I've written a paper on this. I've written a paper on the status of these houses. Because these are legally, uh, you know, legal titles given to the paper, but most of these titles had to be um, uh, kind of circulated through the informal economy in order to make people keep their plots. Because the requirement that you can keep the plot only if you build a structure within three months. They wanted to prevent um, people just keeping the land, going back to the city, building a jukki there, and then later on, when they retire, making a house there. But it meant for many people to actually make a house, they needed money, so they had to um, you know, sell this land to someone, or at least uh, mortgage it, and then build the house. So most of these, so I you know, went through these various houses and said, can you show me your plot papers? And then you know, they come with all kinds of things, why this plot paper is not there, why they have the neighbor's plot paper. Like, for example, one person, he was rich, so he had all kinds of plot papers, but he didn't have a plot paper, it was all plot. So there were all these kind of, I've written the whole article about this, it's very interesting, so I won't talk about it now. So the legal state of this whole thing is very complicated. But what I want to talk about today is um, uh, the kind of discourse um, scholars were having. Now, I got interested in resettlement colonies because I felt the way that policy makers were kind of getting rid of poor people through demolishing slums was very parallel to the way that middle class scholars were writing poor people out of their texts in very good intentions. The good intentions were that they were focusing on how middle class people and their passion products were cleaning up the city. What you didn't really learn is so where did these people go? No one actually went to the places as if these people suddenly no longer existed. I couldn't find any traces of these poor people in any academic text. And that was what made me curious. I thought, so, so what? So, yeah. In all of these texts, there were texts in a very critical leftist perspective looking at um, um, you know, state of structural violence inflicted upon these people. So there's Amita Babiska, she's of course famous, a very established Delhi scholar, I admire her work, I know her personally, who has very interestingly analyzed how environmentalism in India becomes a bourgeoisie enterprise. Because it classifies not only particular kind of environment, uh, um, environmental uh, problems um, solely you know, to kind of the habits of kind of modern urban living, but that Poor people become targeted for producing it. So slums are dirty. Now we could ask why are they dirty? It's not, you know, people are using less resources, they're using less water, they're using less of all these things, but they're dirty because people perceive them to be dirty. So cleaning the city is getting rid of poor people and making parks. And this is a way, you know, my way of environmentalism. 
So, the, you know, and, and this is what she's questioning, you know, whether environmentalism is, should not be a, a collaborative project between all kinds of people, when actually the poor people are those who know how to um, save resources. Who is using the waste of the middle class? They are buying it from the Kabadi, uh, the poor people are buying the newspaper of the Kabadi. If you use it for a toilet, for example, how do you do toilet in Islam? You buy a newspaper, you do your toilet, and you throw the newspaper. So this is what happens to your newspaper. Rather than considering this part of environmental management, you know, middle class would say, yes, get rid of the poor people, we get rid of the dirt. Because they don't have toilets. Uh, Armin uh, Raja Gopal, who is a very famous professor in the United States, makes a very interesting article about commodity aesthetics. And he says people see films, start traveling internationally, and they want India to be like these places. We'll make Delhi into Paris, we make Delhi into Singapore. These are the models. And um, by importing these models, um, I remember very vividly the discussion around the Namda River um, bed. Um, so here's this discussion, I, I'm sure lots of you have read it in the newspaper. You do this discussion, why doesn't it look like um, Dusseldorf Rhine River? Why doesn't it look like any of the promenades you have in, uh, in Singapore? Why doesn't it look like Seine Promenade in, uh, in Paris? Well, it doesn't look like it's because it's a totally different type of river. It's a flood river. It doesn't carry water all along. So you can't even do it, even if you want it, if you could put all the money in, you can't do it. But still this fantasy of this is what our city must look like. So rather than looking at what would be an indigenous way of shaping the city and making it beautiful, you start importing models, kind of superposing, imposing them on your own city, and then develop these kind of development models. And so he's critiquing this. He's critiquing the kind of aesthetics that drives these kind of projects. Um, and then there's uh, Marshall Gartner, who's again um, a, a, a scholar from the States who's been in, in, uh, in England for very long, who speaks about governmentality. Now, governmentality, probably most of you are uh, familiar with, is a Foucauldian notion in which um, bodies become governed through particular kind of projects that discipline them in ways that they fit into particular kind of projects. So in other words, if you don't fit in, then you have to go to a resettlement colony. Or what I've argued in the paper about these uh, uh, difficult statuses of the, um, of the plot papers, I argue that in order to legitimize your existence in the global city, you have to produce a particular kind of aesthetics, and that's the aesthetics of a house. A brick house. Jugi won't do. Jugi will always illegalize you. So what people would say to me is, I said, I told them that your papers are illegal. I mean, with this, you know, you know, easily they can remove you from here. What gives you the confidence uh, of investing into this place that you will actually be able to stay? And they say, the more it looks back up, the more difficult it becomes for them to destroy it. So basically, what happens is that they reckon. That if we develop an urban aesthetic that appeals to the notion of the global city, this will legitimize us more than papers which anybody can't get. Right? So, um, in other words, people are forced through a particular kind of aesthetics to produce a kind of behavior that is beyond their means, that fulfills the, no, the, the desire of the state to have a proper city without slums. Now, what you see is here, these are all top down um, arguments. I think all these arguments are valid. They're all important and they've all taught us a lot in terms of understanding how contemporary urban gentrification is taking place. What they don't tell us is so what about these people? Do they have any opinion? Do they feel as if they are part of a project of governmentality? Do they feel as if there's, you know, what do they think about this aesthetic? Do they like it? Do they not like it? And the first finding I had when I went to South Africa was people were very ambivalent about it. There were more names that it's difficult out there, that they no longer have the income, but they were also happy. They liked the place. It was open, uncongested, free, um, they had space, they had a proper house. So in other words, it was not at all only moaning. There were, you know, there were um, at least those who had little means to sustain the first five years, which are, this is documented, so there are economic studies which document that if people 
um, uh, undergo such a heavy rupture. This might be a, a, an earthquake, or it might be a, a typhoon, or it might be a, a forced resettlement. Most of them need five years to recover economically. So what they find is that only those people can actually take advantage of an opportunity like this. If you look at it as an opportunity and not just as an outcasting, um, only those can take opportunity who have the means to survive five years. Um, so, um, so what we are looking at today is people in the South Agirre are living there who have these needs and you would find only 40% of those actually original allotties and all the others who have sent and left and other people have come in. And this is another irony of this place. The irony is the idea is to decongest Delhi, right? To get these people out, to create some air. But what it does is by by sending them out so far, you actually create hubs of growth. It's very close to village. Now villagers want to urbanize, they're very keen to urbanize. So what you see here is suddenly, if you ask who is buying them, who is opening the shops, who is doing the business, all the villagers around. So suddenly you see how a new hub of growth is actually kind of connecting, you know, this distant resettlement colony to the city and basically speeds up the growth of Delhi as a city which is counterproductive in terms of policy making. Now there is, um, let me, I have a little time, is that how, how, how long? 45 minutes, even an hour at the moment. I start to have a sleep off. So one of the things I thought was fascinating is, I think we need to understand this not just as a particular kind of Indian project, but we need to of course understand it as a global project. And there are two times uh, that are predominantly uh, discussed in terms of gentrification. That is the 1990, kind of post-1990, and just regardless whether you're to America, to Africa, to Asia, um, across the board, you find a very rapid gentrification of certain cities. Um, and the, sec the second thing is um, that you have a very parallel development in the beginning of the 20th century. So we're looking at 1889 to 1920, when European cities became gentrified very rapidly. So these two periods, if we map them onto each other, I think we can learn you know, from what happened then and what happens now, how it is different or similar possibly. So we're looking at some of these texts. Um, Barcelona is interesting um, because um, I found this text, um, which, I, um, which you can read, so eradicating the reason tangible past, decay, the smells, the dirt that had con converted the value and history of place, and then transforming this decaying landscape into a future image of promotional brochures. This is how he defines gentrification. So basically, gentrification is thin thinning out the landscape in terms of the central experience. It should be not loud, it should be not smelly, it should be so, in other words, it should be a space that is not centrally dense, which is something that informs also heritage discourse. And something where religious way of appropriating heritage and the heritage discourse clearly clash. Because heritage museums are supposed to be church like, they're supposed to be quiet, they're supposed to be, you know, these kind of open spaces full of light, and they're not supposed to be congested and smelly, and there's no supposed to be and butter and you know, all these kind of things. Um, so I think it's very important to look at this question is where does this come from? Why do we associate central density with something that is undesirable? That's a question. And I think if we go back 100 years, we will have an answer because um, this is a marketplace in Europe in ages. And um, of course it's characterized by something you know here. Um, you have all kinds of um, things going on, the market is there, um, there's no sewage system, there's, um, there's kind of lots of paper, a very congested place, and what happens is with industrialization, when suddenly the number of people increase hugely within a very short time, this becomes a problem. And then uh, you get this, you get the notion that unless you clean this up, it becomes a breeding ground for um, uh, for uh, sickness, social sickness and physical sickness. So it is the birth of uh, the notion of hygiene as popular notion. 
as a medical concept, it's a little older, but as a popular notion, uh, that this informs the way urban cities are governed. And we talked about Morgana having a sewage. Um, so here are the issues, right? The issues are um, how do you keep cities in which too many people are living in such a crime space, how do you keep them clean? And we associate a thin center experience with heightened. This is an association which we have built over the years because when, it's, when it smells, then we think you know, there's too much toilet happening, there's too much sweat happening, there. and this we associate with sickness. And there are reasons for this, there are good reasons for this. And these reasons, um, they are rooted in the discourse which is happening here because we experience that you know, there's plagues, there's all kinds of he uh, health issues. And these have resolved in European cities at this point through public housing, through um, investment and all these kind of you know, urban amenities. And this is a picture of Vienna, and uh, it's also 100 years ago. So 100 years ago, Vienna was one of the hubs for developing a notion of um, sound pollution. So here is where the story of sound pollution begins, where sound was just not just disturbing, not just um, undesirable possibly, but it became a measure commodity which you could regulate, right? So we can now say a city should not be louder than this, or cars cannot be allowed till that. So in other words, everything that we are speaking in terms of um, a desirable regu regulation, in terms of environmental regulation, this is where it begins. Because the city is in a crisis in Europe in the 1990s, let's say, 2010 in this period. So lots of these regulations go back there, and this is where our association with, um, with uh, when, when they go back to. So the question then is, so, so basically this is a, what I'm trying to say is these scientific models inform not just our rational thinking, but they inform our central experience. They are divides, right? The way we go through is, this is how we experience it, and this experience is um, rooted in a particular kind of understanding of what it means if something is noisy or something is smelly. Um, so the question then was, what do these people see? That we assume they don't have too much schooling, they have learned to wash their hands, but they do not usually kind of have all these underlying them. But they also have, of course, central experiences. And, um, okay, I'll leave Singapore out, this is kind of getting too much. Okay, so what's happening here? I've taken this photograph, it's, it's a favorite one because you can immediately see that something very important is happening. Papers, how did they survive? How do you survive when from one day to another you're forced to build a house for which you don't have any money and you are, you are all your um, social security finishes. Once you change an address in India, uh, you cannot get a ration, you cannot get a pension. All these things have to be renewed. Now, I don't have to tell you how long it will take. And it will take so long for you to get an internet connection. It will get ten times longer for a poor person to get it, right? So in other words, there's no social security. Stop <laughs> <laughs> Out there, it's out, out there is really funny. You have a mobile phone, and then because you're just very close to Haryana, it is depending on, the, you know, the, so the whole day you're getting messages, welcome in Haryana, welcome in Delhi, welcome in Haryana, depending which, uh, which lane you go, you know, some town will catch you. <laughs> it's very funny. It, it kind of marks the marginality of the, of the space. Um, so what happens? How do people do it? You know, how do you do it? And, and here's your answer. They mobilize what they know. They see land. And what they see is they see, actually they see land. So they begin to have animals. Now, uh, this policy of the government uh, stipulates that you may not uh, undertake any agricultural activity. But this is the first thing they do. You know, they undertake agricultural uh, activity. They get in cows, much to the mis dismay of the uh, buffaloes, much to the dismay of the officer who keeps going through there and saying, uh, not allowed, not allowed, not allowed. They have goats, they have. Um, my daughter, she went there and encountered the animals. Like, I stopped at some point. Ducks and pigs and all kinds of things. Then you have, of course, the uh, must uh, have mud cakes. Now you can't so easily collect with there as you could, you know, as I see people doing here. You know, they 
climbing all the way up the steeper to collect wood every day. Um, there, of course, there is not so much wood in them. You know, these are hundreds and hundreds of papers, so um, they try to get fuel, fuel for, uh, for, their, for their stoves because they no longer uh, have access to kerosene, which they used to cook with before that. Then you see this drying way on, right? Again, I think I'm having, uh, no, <coughs> so here this drying part is going on, and then we also on other days you see the drying of grains. So you wonder what happens here. In the, this is um, reverse mobility. In the terms of, um, I've, I've read an article, it was a very interesting article, saying that the Indian agriculture, the small scale agriculture, is surviving, surviving because it is. Um, supported and um, it's almost like a subvention by the urban dwellers who are doing the kind of uh, low class jobs. So every family has one or two migrants and they go to the city and they send back the money or they, reach the, they seasonally go back to the field helping in the harvest. Right? You have a whole circle. So what we knew already is that the remittances uh, networks extend far into kind of the, the rural spaces and they basically spaces um, alive because if there's a crisis then it's from here that the money will come to buy new um, seeds for example after a rain uh, season like this where the new seeds come from they come from because some relatives there in fact this makes strategies I've met several so here's a family has three sons and they don't have any land um, so the first son is uh, sent to a contractor on a bond labor and for that they can get so and so many land that means the son has to work um, as a bonded labor for 20 years with this contractor going from one side to the other working. This money is used to buy land so that the second one can actually live on that land and um, grow whatever and sell to the market. The third son is sent to the um, city because there has to be flow of money for hospital expenses for this and that. So, so this is happening in all kinds of families. And regardless of where you go to poor people, you ask them in the village, you know, kind of that kind of story. Like, you know, it's his privacy, of course, and he can, he can choose to tell anyone or not. But it's the same story. Just several sons, and then some. Uh, some uh, one has to do this, other has to do this. this. How these negotiations happen, one will have to look at. So here you now suddenly the reverse happens, and I've not seen that before. What happens is the grains is coming. Suddenly the grains are coming, so people can survive. They have fuel, they hold animals, they have milk, they have all the grains from the village, and they can get back on the feet for five years to be then able to send again. And uh, when I, I'm into e-banking at the moment, looking at e-banking, so um, the policy makers are of course frustrated because they wanted e-banking because they wanted the saving rate to go up, right? So um, you see um, Koshik Basu making these calculations, so I've had a long talk with him about it. So basically, you know, making these calculations that if the saving rate uh, keeps dropping, then you know the, the credibility will, will, will kind of also drop. So we need to keep it up. How do we keep it up? By mobilizing more money into the banks, where do we get it from the poor people, and so on. Problem is, people are actually not saving. What they're doing is remitting. Them. So what you see, e-banking companies doing who are interested in the kind of what they call the bottom of the curve, they are developing remitting uh, infrastructure because people find that if you can remit on a daily basis rather than a monthly basis then your money is safe. So they don't put it in the bank but they send it home straight away. This is where they want e-banking. They don't want it for all this kind of work policy. So there's quite an interesting negotiation right, right now going on. You know, the, the government having certain policies to open everyone's bank account but the people using these bank accounts for ways they were not supposed to be used. Here you see the garden happening. Can you see it? So this one of these, you see these are the parts, right? So 